Hi, I'm Torben Janssen from thoughtsonjava.org. Today I will talk about six best practices you should follow for creating readable and maintainable code. But before we start, please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get new JPA and Hibernate tutorials every week. Implementing a readable and maintainable persistence layer with Hibernate isn't as easy as it might seem. It often starts with just a few annotations on some Java classes and a small number of strings containing things like JPQL or native query statements and references to attributes, queries, and bind parameter names. As the project grows, you implement more and more entity classes. What's even worse, you also create hundreds of strings that you use somewhere in your business code. This quickly transforms a small and well-structured persistence layer into a huge mess. You can avoid at least some of these problems by following the best practices I show you in this video. You can find lots of articles and videos explaining how to write maintainable Java code. All of that advice is also valid for your persistence layer. In the end, it's still Java code, isn't it? But that advice isn't enough. You can follow general Java best practices and still build a messy persistence layer. JPA and Hibernate heavily rely on string references, which quickly get unmaintainable, and the managed lifecycle introduces invisible functionalities and requirements. So you need to take it one step further and not only follow best practices for Java, you also need to apply specific best practices for a persistence layer using JPA or Hibernate. But don't worry, that's much easier than you might think. Let's start with one of the most annoying parts of JPA and Hibernate. Magic strings that reference entity attributes, queries, bind parameters, entity graphs, and so on. After you worked on a project for several months, it's often hard to remember where you used which string, and it gets even worse if you have to refactor an entity and you need to change all strings that reference a renamed attribute. The best and only thing you can do to avoid these problems is to introduce string constants for at least each element you reference in your business code. If you want to take it one step further, you could even introduce constants for all entity attributes. You can then use these constants in your code instead of magic strings. By doing that, you get a few things back that you lost in the first place. You can use your IDE to find all places in your code that call a specific query or use any other named element. It gets much easier to find and reuse existing queries that already fetch the required information. And if you need to rename an attribute or any other named element, you simply change the value of the string constant. So better spend the extra effort to create the string constants. It will make your life much easier as soon as you need to change or debug your code. If you're working with some of JPA's APIs, like the Criteria API or the Entity Graph API, you should prefer JPA's metamodel classes over string constants. The metamodel consists of static classes that your persistence provider, for example Hibernate, can generate at build time. You can then use them in your code to reference entity attributes in a type-safe way. Unfortunately, JPA doesn't specify how these classes get generated, and each implementation provides its own option. If you're using Hibernate, you only need to add a dependency to the Hibernate JPA modelGen artifact to your Maven POM XML. During your next build, Hibernate generates a static class for each entity class. Here you can see a simple example of an order entity and the order underscore class which describes the entity. You can then use the order underscore class with most of JPA's APIs. I use it here to select the order number and customer attributes of the order entity. Another way to improve the readability and usability of your entities is to use field-based access. It's one of the two access strategies supported by JPA and Hibernate. You use it by annotating your entity attributes with the mapping annotations. That puts all mapping information at the top of the class, and you can get a quick overview of all mapped attributes. In addition to that, it gives you the freedom to implement the getter and setter methods in any way you want. By using field-based access, you tell Hibernate to use reflection to set or get the values of an attribute. That enables you to omit these methods completely 
or to implement them in a way that makes your entity comfortable to use. I recommend you opt for the second option. You could, for example, introduce a utility method that manages a bidirectional association. It's easy to forget to update both ends of an association. So why not offer a method for it? It's a general best practice for too many associations. Named bind parameters are an easy and effective way to improve the readability of the code that executes a query. That's especially the case if you combine it with my first recommendation and create a string constant for it. As you can see in the code, named bind parameters and string constants don't provide any benefits when you define the query. But they do when you execute the query. By using a named bind parameter, you make your code easier to understand because everyone can immediately see which value it sets for which bind parameter. You can use query hints to provide additional information about a query and to activate or deactivate certain features of the entity manager. You can use it to mark a query as read-only, activate Hibernate's query cache, set an SQL comment, reference an entity graph that shall be applied to a query, and much more. I summarized the most interesting ones in 11JPA and Hibernate query hints every developer should know. Unfortunately, you need to provide these query hints as strings. So we are again struggling with another form of JPA's magic string problem. Let's be honest. Magic strings are annoying, and that's especially the case if they are long and complicated, like the one here. Thanks to the Hibernate team for providing the org.hibernate.annotations.query hints and the org.hibernate.graph.graph semantic classes with string constants for most query hints. Using that class, you can rewrite the previous example to use the graph semantic.fetch constant instead of javax.persistence.fetch graph. The last recommendation that I want to give in this video is to use the tuple interface to handle query results that contain multiple objects. You can see an example of such a query in the following code snippet. That query selects the ID and the order number of an order entity as Scala values. If you don't want to use a DTO projection, you can either process each record as an object array or as a tuple interface. The tuple interface is the better option. It provides methods to access each element of a record in the result set by index or by alias. You can even automatically cast each of them to the correct type. Implementing a persistence layer with Hibernate is easy but it requires a set of best practices and a little bit of discipline to create it in a way that keeps your code readable and maintainable. To achieve that, you should use string constants for query, parameter, and attribute names, use the JPA meta model when working with JPA's criteria API, use field-based access to keep all mapping annotations at the top of the class, use named bind parameters to improve the readability of the code that executes the query, and use the string constants of Hibernate's query hints and graph semantic classes to set query hints, and should also use the tuple interface to process query results that return more than one object. Okay, that's it for today. If you want to learn more about Hibernate, you should join the free Thoughts on Java library. It gives you free access to a lot of member only content, like a cheat sheet for this video and an ebook about the Java 8 support in Hibernate 5. I'll add the link to it to the video description below. And if you liked today's video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe below. Bye!